Okay. Again, this is Bob Seymour, uh, who is here to talk. Of, we, this is our um, regularly uh, presented program, Fireside Forestry, Civil Culture Q&A. We also have Jessica Leahy, his um, very um, exciting and uh, wonderful partner in crime, who is very knowledgeable as well. So probably will jump in when you can, Jess, um, on questions and um, experiences that you're having in your woods. Bob and Jessica were actually uh, Tree Farmers of the Year in 2020. So I know, uh, I'm sure many of you attended the uh, Forestry Field Day this year. We had to postpone it. <clears throat> so it happened in 2021 at their Wikipedia Woods <clears throat> location in Sebec. It was a wonderful event. So I see today also is a chance for people to do any follow-up questions. If you were on Bob's tour uh, during that event, um, this is your chance to uh, ask some questions and, and get a sense of, uh, um, get a, you know, get more information from from Bob, we have a, a whole hour. So I'm just going to pass it over to Bob and let him, uh, maybe if you want to say a few words of introduction and um, get things kicked off. But if you have a question, the best way to go about it is uh, you can turn your video on, put your hand up if you like, you can use the uh, hand raising feature on your reactions button. Um, if you uh, click on the bottom of your video screen, you'll see reactions and then you click on raise hand or you can just speak up. You can um, unmute yourself and just say, I have a question. So I'm gonna leave it as that. And Bob, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, good morning, everybody. It has indeed been a busy late summer and fall for us. We actually had a big timber sale going on in one of our woodlots. I posted a couple, maybe three or four YouTube videos on about this. This was on a land down in Bucksport, actually very near the, the property where we hosted the, Cy Balch and I hosted the field day on October 2nd, talking about oak silviculture, which I wrote about in the last newsletter. So that's certainly fair game, as is anything else. You can ask me any question you want about forestry. I may or may not have an answer. <laughs> if I don't, I'll, I'll tell you. Jess may then weigh in. So um, what else, Jess, have we been doing? Not, yeah, I mean, that's been enough, actually. We just visited the aftermath of the harvest yesterday. It would have, uh, in the woods look great. Some of the main trails would have been a lot better had it not rained 10 inches in the last month. <laughs> there were some uh, issues there that we'll have to fix with the excavator, but that's, that's uh, logging in the fall, does that. Almost no way around it, so. But the woods look great. We were very happy with the outcome in general. So who wants to go first? Well, I was going to add a little bit more about what yeah. we've been up to in case other folks want to share what they've been doing for the fall. The uh, We've been doing a little thinning of our understory, uh, spacing red spruce at this lot in Bucksport. And then we mentioned this at the field day, but we were able to acquire a neighbor's property next door to Wikipedia Woods in Sebec. And so we've started to do the inventory there. And it was, uh, it has a much different management and ownership history than Wikipedia Woods, which has 50 years of stewardship. And there's, um, there is not a lot of trees on this <laughs> new woodlot. And so we have a, yeah. a interesting challenge <laughs> that will, you know, we've often had these really great woodlots and this one has kind of uh, been a bit abused, a little orphaned, and now we have the challenge of uh, our restoration plan for it. So we're starting to wrap our head around that. And I think it will help because a lot of people buy cut over land and have to figure out what to do with it. And uh, now we're going to have the real life experience of that. So I'm really um, eager yeah. to have, have that, even though it's not, um, you know, it uh, wish something did, and, you know, hadn't got it before some things happened. Yeah, it would have been nice. It had, instead of 50 years of stewardship, it had 45 years of essentially benign neglect, paying the taxes, and then five years of exploitation, which is probably way more common, sadly. Uh, so, but now we own it. And Mike Dan said that land has never had a better, it's never been so lucky. I will, I guess we'll see. <laughs> I take that as a great compliment, but anyway, um, the land really doesn't care actually, but uh, we do. So, 
I see right. Mr. Pryor from Wisconsin has a yes, question. Yes, Ross. Welcome, Ross. <clears throat> yeah, who has a question? Fire away. There we go. Hi, Ross. All right. Uh, in, in your video, you made the point that you set up the harvester forwarding trails at 80, at 80 feet apart. What is the thought process behind that number? Um, so we use this uh, almost exclusively this Ponzi long reach cut the length technology, which has a range. I think it's in terms of feet, it's about 32, 34 feet from the center of the machine to the extent of the end of the boom where he can cut a tree. So that if you double that, you get about 70, 65, 70 feet that he can reach on both sides of the trail. So then we push them even a little bit farther, right? I want to really minimize, the whole thing is to minimize the footprint of that trail, right? Because by doing that, you then have, the more you do that, the more you have uh, ability to really discriminate in a partial harvesting prescription, rather than you know accepting the geometry that some trees are going to have to be cut for access, right? So the, you want to minimize that. So you can push them, they will then uh, track off the trail this slows them down. And of course, in the perfect world, they wouldn't want to do this, but they will certainly do it <clears throat> if the volume is high enough. And actually, so, so we go to 80 feet. The, it turned out um, this recent harvest, it was in very steep ground where you couldn't just lay in it like a 80 foot geometry. You had to just find ways up a very steep pitch. Um, and we, of course, map all these trails. We give the harvester operator a, a Venza map with all of this. And with my ArcGIS skills that we have, I can easily figure out what the total length of all these trails is. I think in this particular lot, it was about 2.8 miles or something of trails on 34 acres. If you do the math on that, it turns out that the actual spacing is 120 feet uh, we ended up with here. So this was this was amazing, yeah, and we just walked it yesterday, and it uh, it was difficult to see from trail to trail, which is what you want, of course. This is, and this was a little bit lighter harvest. He was able to maneuver around in the stand, and I mean, I don't <clears throat> think I didn't hear any bad blowback over this. The other plus is with this mechanized system, if you, the more wood you put on a single trail, the more productive the forwarder is. Right. So the harvester productivity may go down a little bit by having to track off the trail, cut a tree, you know, like 40 feet away from the trail. But more wood accumulates in, in fewer lineal feet of trail that way. So the forwarder product productivity, the machine that brings the wood from the trail to the roadside is higher <clears throat> if you space the trails wider. I mean, in an extreme case, imagine everything went onto a single trail. There'd be this, like, there could be a wood yard, right, along the trail. A forwarder would just be incredibly productive. So, uh, so that's about balance. The forwarder had gotten kind of behind. Actually, this was the first job we had where the forwarder, the harvester was completely done before the forward even showed up. So this was a little awkward, right? So he had no ability, really. Sometimes you need a forwarder to pick something up, right? Uh, they, we actually had to install bridge mats because we were crossing a brook with this. There's a video of that too, that they had to put in with an excavator instead of the forwarder, which is sometimes what's used, right? You can just lug them out in his bunk, put them in with the crane, set them in over the brook and you're good to go. But no, this, this case, they had to bring in a, you know, a big excavator who had to track into the forest, big heavy machine that didn't help the trail. Um, <clears throat> so this is what you get in these systems, but it's about minimizing that footprint. And also when we, Usually we mark the wood first without thinking about where the, well, not, without laying out any trails. We, of course, are observing where the trails might go. And then we come back and we'll lay in the trails and ribbon those. And the, the trails are not straight. They will meander a little bit. You, you can't do like big, you know, loops, but you can weave, especially in taller stands. And with that, we end up with almost zero loss for trails of our, our intended crop trees. We know this from plots, right? There's all, we can avoid, you know, because when you're laying out the trail, you see, okay, here's a nice spruce or whatever we want to leave right in the trail, just set over it, run the ribbon around the right a little bit as you're tracking and recording this trail. And it all works out just fine. And you, you can't, like at Wikipedia, for example, where you were, um, we had 11 miles of trails there on 130 acres, I think it was the number. And I'll bet you can maybe see 10% of those on aerial imagery taking afterwards, 10%.
go up and look in northern Maine where grapple skitters uh, run every 50 feet. And it's just like it's what people have called this non-selective partial harvesting, right? <laughs> where essentially the only uh, wood is cut is in this zone, heavy cut along a 30 foot wide strip of a trail and then little isolated strips that aren't, <clears throat> excuse me, where nothing is done. And then another big wide strip, right? So this probably removal is about 50, 60%. And, and you have no ability with that kind of, that's the other extreme, right? You, of course, you don't want to do that when we're trying to apply stewardship because we're trying to do a partial harvest where we pick every tree. That's critical. So um, that's why we do it. And, um, and we've now done this, I think, uh, five, four or five just of our own woodlots we've used this way. I've also used this machine when I was still active on the faculty. We used the same crew actually to do a bunch of research trials our expanding gap experiments were cut with this machine. So we have a lot of experience with this one operator and he's just excellent, doesn't mind doing it. And um, so that's the reason. You can certainly do that if you're gonna use a cable skitter or some lower technology, um, you know, you can of course weave even more and you know, they, he can go anywhere, right? Pull cable, so that's possible too. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Probably too much. <laughs> You're muted, Russ, I think. Thank you. That answers the question. I'm trying to get out of the sun here right now. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, you know, I think that actually laying out the ability to take charge of a harvest operation and lay out trails and tell the machine where to go is, is the hardest thing foresters learn to do, right? It's just because you, you're always being bullied by the operators who think they know better. And it's just like, you don't, you just don't deal with that. This is your land, right? Or your client's land. And you need to take charge of that. And they need to do what you tell them to do. And if they don't want it, they can go cut somewhere else. And they will almost always follow that, right? But young foresters, especially lack experience. They, they don't, oh yeah, well, he had to go here, right? Um, okay, yeah, I mean, there are to, to, we had severe topographical limitations here, but you, you just have to run straight across the contours, right, straight up and downhill, and so there was some 30% slopes on this job, and they had no problem. If they had just gone out there with no layout, they wouldn't have known where they were going. They, they may have, a, they don't even have a contour map, so it's like, and they don't like to get out of the machine, so they just sort of ad hoc lay out trails from the yard back. And it just ends up in chaos in a job like this. So you have to get out there and lay it out just for harvesting efficiency um, to minimize the, you know, those other environmental reasons to do it too, right? So anyway. Yeah, I see Alan Clark has his hand up next. I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, Alan, uh, go ahead. Okay, good. It's good to see you, Bob. I haven't talked to you for almost 30 years. I worked in Maine for 25 years and then went out west to Utah, so. But we're oh, back yes. at, yeah, so long time ago, forest surveys and all kinds of stuff we yeah. I worked on you with, so. How about, yeah. Well, welcome back. Well, it's good. Yeah, my wife and I spend the summers there. We, I, I was curious about one of the things Jessica said that, or that you mentioned. <laughs> my wife and I have always, I've always worked with thousands of acres, and now my wife and I have uh, picked up two small woodlots, total of about 130 acres adjacent ones in Jefferson. And one of them was managed by a uh, um, timber company, I, I guess. It's Haynes had one of the lots and just was so far from all their stuff. They did a harvest and they did fairly well in the harvest. It wasn't a strip <clears throat> and weed deal. The one adjacent to it sounds like the one that Jessica described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was just curious, I, I'm sitting there saying, what am I, what do I need to do now? You know, and so I, <laughs> you've got the boundaries figured out. So that was the first thing that we spent a couple of years doing, because of course the boundaries, it was a subdivision, subdivision of, yeah. of yeah. property. So after you get that, what's your, what are you intending to do with that lot you picked up that's adjacent that's been, you know, this one's probably been uh ill-treated for 150 years instead of 50 years but yeah <clears throat> well so we're just curious where, where sure. do you go from here <clears throat> i think the this property this particular property unlike the rest of our land was never in tree growth tax law right so that the first job is to get that 
in the system. So we're not paying $1,000 a year taxes when we could be paying 150. So is your land been in tree growth? Did you hear the plan or anything? Uh, no, it's not in tree growth. So okay. that, that was kind of on my list of the next thing to do. Uh, so the, what you need to do that. then, the, the, the big step there is to, somebody, if you have the skills, I, I don't remember, are you a forester, Alan? Are you, you know how to? Uh, forestry minor, wildlife major. Okay. Yes, that's okay. So you, you understand what a forest type map is. You could make one yourself sure. probably, right? Um, yes. So that's, the, that's really what you need. Although a licensed forester, you're probably not licensed in Maine. Um, um, you would have to get somebody, a licensed forester, to sign off on your map and plan. Uh, you know, a heavily cut over lot, the plan can just be let it grow for 30 years, right? Or whatever, right? Uh, for some period of time. There's nothing wrong with that if that's what's out, what you've inherited. Sounds like one of the two lots is like that. The other one, you might actually be able to do some, you know, activities. So we're, we're trying to get familiar with the property. You can, you can, of course, if you're skilled, you can look at imagery and make sort of a map, but especially these heavily cut over lands, there's a lot of just sort of, it's not bare ground, but the trees, you know, or there's a lot of voids and stuff and you don't know really what's growing there if they're just all saplings. So you have to walk it. And I think, so I would, I would prioritize making a, a tight map and then maybe map also map, um, you know, main, you know, access point roads or trails or however it was logged, the landings, all of the, the, the sort of the logging, harvesting infrastructure, if you will, that was used. And that may or may not be in the right place. If it's all forested, then you shouldn't, you won't get into complications with happen to take out land for buildings or, or maybe there are buildings. You live on the land. Is this a, just a absentee property? I guess you said you, you come in the summer. Yeah, we, we have a place in Whitefield that's separate from this. So this okay, is so forest land. No, it that has makes pretty it, good road access. Yeah, that's clean, though, then. You don't have buildings that right. you have to pay. Okay, so this is that's a good situation as a woodlot owner, um, uh, from a tax standpoint, at least. And uh, so that's what we're doing. And we're also, we put in, and this is, a, this is a legacy of my forest, my silviculture research career. I like good information. So we're out there putting in, we're not actually measuring the plots. We're just putting in plot centers that we will come back to and measure the trees. In this case, it'll go fast because there's not a lot of merchantable wood. <laughs> we'll have to see how we're going to sample regeneration and sampling uh, growing stock, I guess. Pieces of it were never cut because they're incredibly steep. Uh, I mean, so it's a, it's a very interesting, diverse property. It has a wetland on one end of it. Um, um, we're, we're happy to have acquired this and get to know it. So uh, we're right in that process. So we will write then a tree growth plan you have to have that. I think the deadline is April 1st. They have to be into the towns. Um, so they towns will then, you know, annually bill you accordingly. If you have it in by April, then they, they, they will then change your taxation. So that would, that will save you hundreds of dollars, if not thousands. Go, Jess, what else? Well, I was going to say, uh, I, you know, Bob's always very focused on the trees. I'm, uh, I'm, trying to find positives to this uh, woodlot that has no tree, you know, very little trees. So uh, I'm, I'm checking out the view, I'm taking photos. I'm trying to like connect with the property and find, um, you know, these other things to focus on while we wait for the trees to grow. There's some raspberry patches that have come in as a result of the recent harvesting that we didn't do. And so we're, uh, we're thinking, oh, we got to put this on our calendar for, sort of late summer or try to figure out when the raspberries are going to be ripe and um, take advantage of that opportunity that is, you know, we try to trade raspberry on our other properties because it inhibits the, you know, regeneration and it kind of delays the new trees getting started. So um, that's something that we don't try to promote on our other properties, but we're going to try to make the most of it. And then the other major thing that we're thinking about while we're walking through the property is access. Because while we don't need access for timber harvesting now, there might be some intermediate treatments we want to do, or we just want to be able to walk and, um, you know, get, get through the property. So trying to figure out, okay, if we were going to try to open up some trails and stuff, where would we do that? How's the right. topography line out and stuff? And that just again, trying to create enjoyment and the ability to use it while we wait for it to restore. 
Great, thank you. Richard, you have I your see, hand up? Yeah, Richard, and then back to Ross. Richard, you sound garbled to me. I think something's wrong with you. Yeah, maybe try try turning your video off, Richard, and sometimes that then lets it focus on the audio for the bandwidth. Yeah, it's still garbled. Uh, may, could you type it into the chat, maybe? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. All right, well, Richard's typing into the chat. Let's go over to Ross. Okay, uh, this is a follow up from the uh, field day you held. Uh, Jessica, I believe you say when you were looking at the Wicopee Woods, you were concerned that the understory was all beech and fir. You know, um, I guess my question was, why did that happen? Was that all beech and fir because that there was so much shade? That's the only thing that could grow there, or was it beech and fir because the deer had eaten everything else? You want me to answer that? I'll start if you want. I think uh, it's both. I think. I think there's there's definitely that selective pressure. Uh, you know, for the other species, other than deer don't eat beech or fir, right? Or striped maples, the other, it's the third one that is common in places. But they do eat all the northern hardwoods, right? Um, moose will browse fir, but we don't, I don't think there's, I've never seen a moose track there. I don't, it's pretty, there's moose nearby, I'm sure, but they, and they may wander around, but they're not heavy. Um, it was also true, though, I, I asked Ron Locke, who was an amazing forester, actually, you know, and, and he's still alive. And we, we talk about this land. And I soon after we bought it, I said, Ron, um, in fact, if we go back, I remember walking it, the, the property with, with Ron when we were considering acquiring it with Jess and, it's, and other foresters. And it's like, I'm just looking at all the growing stock. And it's like, I'm just amazed we have a chance to purchase this, right? This is like a tremendous honor. And Jess just says, did you realize that everywhere we went, there's nothing but beach and fur in the understory? <laughs> it's like we have no regeneration. It's like, actually, no, I didn't notice that. But so this is why, you, this is why we make a great team, um, among one, one of many reasons. So, uh, and I think, so I asked Ron about it. So, you, you know, what are you, you know, because he'd measured, he, he was aware of this. He, he says he actually in 50, almost, well, 40 some, 45 years of stewardship of that property, he really never focused on regeneration. You know, the regeneration would happen. He, he didn't mind fur. fur we have mar good markets for fur. And before the, you know, when the winters were cold and the balsam woolly adelgid wasn't around, you could grow fur, nice, beautiful fur, 12 inches DBH, sound as a dollar in about 40 years. So that's nothing wrong with that, right? That's, that's a, a product. Now it's dying from the adelgid and there's, no, there's actually not even any fur regeneration underneath it. So it's a whole new pattern. Um, so he didn't really, so he was all about improvement cutting and just pick, 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 picking around everything, tree by tree, dry tree all the time. And that, that's not a decisive way to regenerate anything. It just releases what's opportunistically established in the understory. So if you have deer, you know, selectively uh, selecting for the, the beach and the fur, that's just what's going to happen because they are shade tolerant. They're easy to regenerate. Fur just has this large seed. It puts out the big seed crops early on, as you know. Beach is the same thing. Anytime you cut beach for firewood, which he did a lot of, it just root suckers everywhere. He never really used much herbicide. He wasn't opposed to it. He just didn't do it. And just was much more concerned about man managing the merchantable trees. And we've sort of finally, we, when we got this, it's like trees. We know the fur is dying. The white birch is dying. We ended up with 20% of the, of the woodlot was cut heavily enough so that the overstory no longer really had any control over what was growing. So it just would have been a beach and fur release cut, an overstory removal, releasing stuff we didn't want to grow. So we just, we took that out. And as you saw, and have, in those cases, we planted pine mostly and oak in the tube. So um, what else, Jess, what about the beach and the fur? It's every, you know, probably two thirds of the lot had this and it was just from the combination of picking. Um, 
not that what we've done is better. We've gotten rid of the beach and the fur mostly. That isn't, that was the easy part. The hard part's replacing it with something better in the presence of these deer. They've not gone away. So, uh, so that, that's why we have gone to the planting, but that's a very expensive option. And, you know, in a, in a functional forest, you wouldn't have to do that. These stands should be now after five years loaded with white birch, you know, these openings, other species, red maple, everything. And they're just sitting there growing raspberries. So, you know, that's, I don't like that. And we need to do something about that. Collect, not just us personally, but um, woodlot owners collectively. And the main IFNW, to their credit, I think we heard a lot more this year about uh, way more doe permits have been issued. Um, and there's a big problem with people not utilizing those, right? I mean, what is the number? Something like 80 or 90% never even get tagged, right? Of these doe permits. Some people even don't even use them, even though they put in for them, right? So they don't actually, even though they issue all these permits, they don't lead to dead uh, female deer. Um, and that's a problem. And even more, I mean, we're kind of on the fringe down like where Richard is and other play people. I mean, the deer are even worse. So it's, and I don't need to tell you this, you're in Wisconsin, that's a chronic problem. So there, right? I mean, yeah. um, Pennsylvania has got it right. Pennsylvania has this DMAP program. I'm, and I, I have been popularizing this. This is what we need in Maine. It's the deer management something program. I forget what the A stands for. So if you're assistance. a landowner, you know about this program? Your management assistant program. Assistance, yeah. So it's a great, uh, I, I think anybody can sign up for it. So I said, so let's just say we sign up for it, Wikipedia. And, and then we have hunters, uh, if we're in that program, hunters can come in, tag a deer. And as soon as they tag any deer, they get another tag, right? So we have hunters, you could have the best hunters get rewarded this way. The meat hunters, right? They want to put four deer in the freezer. Then... Then, then all you go from 30, 40 deer a square mile down to 10 in no time, at least on your land. And you can keep that that way. People that like to see deer, they don't have to do this. There's no coercion, right? This is just allows us that want, really want to get some regeneration back in our properties to kill deer. And you could do it yourself, I think. I think a lot of these landowners are, the one, are also the permittees. We probably wouldn't do that, but there'd be plenty of, we could get plenty of people to go up there and kill lots of deer if we had that ability. We open it. Our lands are open and we encourage it. We put in for any deer. We get them every year and we give them, you can transfer them to other hunters, which all oh, we do all that, but that's, that's only at the margin makes a little bit of difference. We need, you need, we need bigger, more decisive steps here. To, and to I am watching these. So IFNW is not happy with the number of any deer permits that are getting used. Right. Uh, so they're looking at changes and I'm really hoping that they uh, if they don't do DMAP, that they have some other mechanism like Bob and I are able to, while we're not, we don't know how to deer hunt, that we do get these any deer permits and transfer them to our neighbors who are very, you know, we increase the probability of hunting on our land because we're able to get them and give them to our neighbors who will use them who are also putting in, but sometimes aren't successful in getting it. So whatever they end up doing for a policy change, I'm um, I'm hoping that there are these ways for those of us that that would like more deer pressure, uh, hunting pressure on our lands to be able to do that. George, I noticed you unmuted for a little bit. Did you have a question that, that you wanted to ask? And you're muted now, so you'll have to unmute again. You're still muted. There. Yes, <laughs> there we go. Now we can yeah. hear you. No, I, uh, sorry, I'm just finding the right place to click here. Uh, no, I just thought it'd be, I've been a member of the, the group here for quite a while, but I have never attended one of these. I thought it would be fun to to kind of listen in. I have a, a woodlot that I share with other family members in uh, Fayette. And I'm, I'm thinking about deer hunting as well. I've been up once to hunt this year. Mm -hmm. um, my my brother got a doe. He lives up there. Um, Good. And Good. we're we have uh, just shy of twenty acres in our woodlot, and uh, we're just kind of thinking uh, what will be the next step. Um, it's in tree growth, and um, I was out walking it last week. I saw a lot of diseased beach. And uh, that's always, uh, I've seen that for years uh, since I yeah. was a kid. And that's always a shame to see. And I 
don't know really much what to do with that. There's one really large beach I've seen on the property and that doesn't seem to have the nectria on it, but uh, even small ones seem to. So it's hard to know. I don't know enough about that to know what to do, but that's one thing. Maybe mm -hmm. time to maybe time to walk the land with with a pro. Yeah, well, do remember that with the uh, main forest service, you can your local district forester will do free walk and talks with you. You just oh. reach out to them and they'll they'll do it. And if they have you know if you have more extensive questions, they'll connect you to a consulting forester in the area if you don't already mm -hmm. have one. But even if you have a forester it's kind of fun to have the district forester that works for the state come out and, you know, second opinion or just, you know, a different set of eyes on, on what's going out there. Um, so I would recommend that. And they're, they're always eager to go out in the field because other, if you don't call them, then they have to do paperwork and uh, enforcement <laughs> projects and they'd much rather go. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Field. You should definitely do that. What's it's Alyssa. What, Alyssa, is that her? Um, what's her name? Uh, no, Fayette's sort of near Farmington, right? Um, yes. It's, uh, oh, that would be okay. Julie Davenport. Julie, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the main Forest Service, and I could just contact them, and they would find somebody. Yeah, yeah I'll have a, I'll put a link in the in the chat and just. Yeah, I think it would. Find it for there's you. a they have a nice map right on their webpage. You can just find your town and. Okay. You know, you link in there. The beach is, of course, a chronic. It just comes up all the time, and we were just talking yeah. talking about it at length. If it's merchantable size, right, five or six inches or bigger, you can cut that for pulpwood and sell it. the The markets aren't as good as they were, but they, you, you know, that's something you can do with a harvest. The problem, though, is we found that it just will root sucker, right? So you need to herbicide treat the stumps, right? when you harvest the merchantable trees and that keeps them from root suckering that so there we, i mean we know how to get rid of beach it's not this is not an unknown it just does take decisive action like a lot of things in silviculture and then then it that you may end up then with all of this understory beach all the small whippy stuff right in the understory because it just sits there like ross was suggesting the stuff we inherited at wikipedia that's what we cut with our backpack chainsaw and then also spray those stumps. And then, you know, the beach then, you of course do save, we always save the nice uh, uh, resistant ones or even they're now called tolerant. There's some that, that aren't completely resistant, but they live right and they have this kind of scaly looking bark, but not the big cankers. Those are now being called tolerant. They're somewhat resistant to the, to the canker fungus, right? The scale insect attacks them, but they don't, doesn't lead to those cankers. So those things live. And those should always be conserved. And they're almost everywhere. They're not numerous, but they're around, you know, almost every good sized woodlot like yours would have a few. So you definitely want to save those and that's easy to do, right? And um, what else? I mean, without seeing the land, I can't say much more. And then of course, it's like, what the, the real question is, what do then you replace the beach with? And if you hunt the deer hard, you should get hardwood regeneration of other species. Oak, usually if you've got a bad beach problem, those size sites that want to that want to grow like nice red oak and maybe good white pine because they're a little they're they're somewhat fertile they're northern hardwood sites but they're probably a little bit droughty ledgy, whatever they're not the super best northern hardwood cove site deep soils that'll it'll grow sugar maple the beach is not competitive there typically, but it does overrun these other places you know that have been most partly just because they've been mismanaged people just cut beach keep cutting and cutting and cutting. And back when, be before beach was diseased 100 years ago, that probably wasn't a bad thing for, you know, woodlot management for fuel wood, that would, beach was a great species, right? Especially before it got diseased. So that was probably promoted as like, you know, oak and chestnut, those were the species. And, uh, but then when the beach disease came in, which, so you remember it even as a kid. So that's been there a long time. So that's uh, not the best. <laughs> it's like we go back, right? So the, I think the beach bark, uh, the first wave of that came through Maine in the 1930s. And the, the ecology is that there's a killing front, right? The big, all the big old beautiful beach just went from lives to dead. They, they had no resistance. The, and then there's this aftermath forest, which is what you now have. It's probably older than you believe, right? That beach had probably been there a long time and it came back. It wasn't completely uh, susceptible, 
but it did. It killed the tops of the mature trees, but they all suckered because they were had some resistance enough to live on, but they're not resistant to the canker. So they just grow in these gnarly defective stems, but they don't die. And then the, the odd one is truly resistant, right? As you've said. So unfortunately, the what for a beach for forest managers, the most of the beach is in that middle that aftermath category. It's diseased but doesn't die. So it um, and even that will produce nuts and fuel and car fixes carbon. It's not like it's, you know, if that's all you have and you're not, you know, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over not necessarily doing something about it unless it's all dying again. And that, then, it, then you're even losing the carbon sequestration benefits of it. If it's growing, there's a lot of leaf area there. It's fixing carbon, you know, it may not be making you any money, but um, at least it's doing some environmental good just being forested. So anyway yeah, yeah it's, a, so it's a sorry go, go ahead. ahead no please go ahead and it's a it's a really uh, pretty tree i've always liked beach even though they're i guess yeah in a lot of environments they're not they're not well thought of um but w there's also pine and, and yeah. red oak on that property like you were saying and yeah. there's a lot of ledge on it. So it's, right. Yeah, uh, it's just the classic. Yeah, Julie will help you out. Just take a walk with her and <laughs> take it from there. There's some good foresters over there you can hire. Yeah. It does remind me of um, uh, I was working with my coworker, Sarah Nelson. He now works for Appalachian Mountain Club. And she uh, had a woodlot that was primarily like recreation was a primary objective for her. And it was right near Chick Hill in Bangor or Little Chick Hill. Um, and it was very, she loved the beech leaves in the fall, which is funny because with the forester's eye, you're, you don't always like beech as much, And but she loved her beech. And so she was like, kind of, you know, that's often targeted in a harvest and she didn't want all her beech gone because she really wanted her beech leaves in the fall. And it was like, okay, that's doable. And then same with the, she, it was really important to her that people who climb Chick Hill and look down across the, um, sort of landscape they would be in the um just down the hill from them would be her woodlot and she really wanted that um you know upper visual aesthetic to be maintained so that people weren't climbing and summiting and then immediately looking into this very heavy harvest or whatever and the beech leaves are helpful for for that as well leaving the the tallest healthiest ones and then even when you do cut some beach, you, you almost always can't get rid of it. But you mentioned owning, you owning the land with others. That also sounds like uh, one of your management activities might not be on the ground, but making sure you're talking to your family about what they right. want to do and what you want to do and what, what they're noticing on the forest health issues and, and all of that. We can't underestimate those jointly owned properties the talking is <laughs> a biggie in terms of making making stuff happen. Bob, I wanted to point out that Christine Parrish has just joined us. Oh, how about that? Hello, Christine. Can you hear me? You're muted, I guess. And Ross has his hands hand up as well. So okay. Ross, why don't you jump in? On uh, one of your videos, you uh, put up a presentation how you spray white pine with insecticide in the in the spring yes. to kill the weevils. And I believe you use it at, you try to target 20 degree days. How do you figure out when 20 degree days is there? Is that online or is does a local weather station tell you that or no. are you doing that yourself? Uh, there are. There are a number of online calculators. I think the one that I use is uh, from Cornell. So you, it's easy to find. And, you know, of course, these are mostly used by farmers, right, to plant and everything else. That's really the growing degree day concept is an agricultural one. And in, entomologists have found that, you know, because it's about heat accumulation, right, in the spring, that that um, and 20 is not very many, right? So you have to really be alert and be vigilant about, uh, you know, as soon as you start seeing these warm spring days, late mid-April here, um, early May is usually when we end up spraying. And it, all, it t tends to coincide when the pines just begin to break bud and the candles are maybe an inch long. 
I've noticed. That's another, that's a lot of the few people that actually do weevil spraying, the foresters and the contractors, they see, they, that's what they use. They just use the pine phenology themselves. Um, so you can do both, just uh, find that Cornell calculator. And it's just a sigmoid curve that accumulates over time, right? And as soon as you hit the 20, the night, cool thing about it is that you'll see your actual uh, uh, progress for your locality relative to all the, his, like 100 years of historical data, right? About how, you know, two springs ago was the coldest spring ever in May. It just never warmed up. We, we, it was mid-May before we ever got the 20 degree days. And sometimes that happens in mid-April. Right, it was an incredibly cold spring, and um, we didn't spray the weevil then until like the middle of May. Right, this year we sprayed uh, probably what May third or something, early May. Uh, the timing is probably better a little bit, um, but uh, that's what you would do. Yeah, and I wouldn't just use that. I would you keep track of the pine. The if you read some of the older literature says if you're if you're spraying plantations and stuff where you have a lot of pine, then it's easy to go out and actually just observe the weevil itself. They'll be, you'll see them right on the shoots, right? Um, and that, that's another, it's like, so if they're out, I mean, because they're overwintering in the forest floor and they emerge. And as soon as they emerge, you want to go out and spray because they'll start laying eggs. They'll feed a little bit. They'll flitter around, feed in the needles. And within, a, within less than a week, they'll, uh, you know, be, be overpositing, laying eggs on your terminal shoots. So... You can observe the weevils directly if you're if you're on the property and they taking walks around it daily and that kind of thing. That's the best way. Bob, maybe you could talk a little bit about. I mean, we do we have to do that because we've enrichment enrichment planted our pine and it's right. spaced out and doesn't have the if if we had denser natural pine regeneration, we might not have to do that. So what what conditions do you need to do weevil management where, or what might you do if you wanted to manage in a way that didn't require that? Well, you would get, uh, you know, pine shelter was like we have on our university forest to have 5,000 seedlings, right? And, and, no, and then, plus you still have a pine overstory, which uh, leads to, which dampens the weevil populations to some degree. And the weevils will actually attack these big taller trees. So all of that helps. Um, in the cases like where you and I have, we, we don't have any of that. We don't really have much of any of a pine seed source. We may have scattered trees, but we have no pine shelter wood. We have some stands that so we do, some pine stands where we are ma managing shelter wood. And I'm not worried about the weevil there. These are these enrichment plantings where we, just to economize on the planting effort, we know that pine is so, sort of like a hardwood, right? It's the no value is pulpwood. So there's no plant point in planting 800 of them, right? Like you might with spruce or something or studwood you're going to grow saw logs to about what 14 inches probably, and then start commercial thinning. So we're planting them on a 10, 15 foot spacing. So every tree matters. That's what 400 an acre, maybe at most, not even that. Um, probably our average spacing more like 15. So, um, so everyone's precious. If you lose one badly, if you get weaveled multiple years in a row, it's garbage, right? So it won't self-correct from competition like it would in natural regeneration. Well, all my pine plantings are under plantings of hardwood forest because I have yeah. almost no natural white pine. So yes, everyone is precious and it gets a lot of work. It gets bud capped, it gets low pruned, yeah. you know, it gets corrective pruning. So I'm right. trying to save every one. Sure. So, but I have yet to see the weevil on the pine trees. Maybe I'm just looking at the wrong time or I'm, you know, unlucky. But, um, uh, I was, I was, that, that's a good, a, a, a good thumb rule to follow. I'll go by the needle that yeah. the terminal shoot length sounds like a good thumb rule. As soon as that bud breaks, you go out and start studying your pine trees. You'll find, a, you'll see the wheels on a sunny day. You believe me, you'll see them. They're not very big, but in that video that you watch, there is some close-ups of them. You can say, if you know what to look for there. So, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. So Jess is headed out. So yeah, she's got a. She actually has a real job to go to at ten. So <laughs> I could, we can talk all day if we want to. Here, Christine, I, I see she's still here. She, but yeah, she must. She's in listening mode. She says. So okay, she's That's not able to. Fine. Who's got? I'm sure she has a question. She's just too shy to answer. Anyway. <laughs> 
Who else? Well, the, the beauty of a small group is everybody can jump in. Sure. If they would like. Oh. So what one thing that we're I've asked our forester, our land trust forester, Harold Burnett, is to write about his winter plans. I know winter is kind of a go time for woodland owners and uh um I know a lot of people who own woods are in their woods just as much in the winter as they are in the summer. What what do you have? What are you looking ahead and uh, looking ahead to this winter? Um, I'll answer for myself, and others should also. Yeah. Uh, uh, briefly, I think it's it's a good time to do hard work, physical work, because it's you know in the if you're out there trying to cut wood or do like heavy just strenuous activities in July, it's just deadly right because it's too hot but in the winter time it's it's wonderful running chainsaws running tools pruning trees pruning pine trees is a wonderful time to do it actually you can gain uh, if you have some snow two or three feet on snowshoes you can prune that much higher with a pruning saw so there's some actual advantages to working in the winter um it's you can mark uh, timber sales if you're trying to get ahead, you know, with marking. I bet Harold will say that he's do he'll do some marking to try to get ahead. It's like it's also the best time, of course, to do harvesting, right? So if you can get all your harvesting done in the winter on frozen ground, that would be perfect, right? The unfortunate and that used to be the way harvesting was done, like a long time ago. It was just in the winter, everything was uh, snow, deep snow, and it, it the land was just spared all of the heavy equipment damage that happens like we just experienced because of you know wet unfrozen conditions so logging too would be heroin i think would probably especially wetter sites that you can only access then you would want to do all your harvesting then so it can be a busy time for operations people what else i don't know that's <laughs> Unfortunately, Richard, you're you're still garbled. You can't hear. Yeah, that's bad because uh, you've been able to. Your microphone's been or your audio has been okay in the past. But if you yeah. want to email, uh, yeah, as I suggested, maybe email me, Richard, your question or a thought. Because you have, you, Richard's been, I think, on his property for decades. So yeah, that's yeah. the one thing about. That's the one thing that um you can't replace is uh is time <laughs> and bob one thing that's interesting about you and jess is that you got to know i mean when you when you acquire your land you actually learn about its past you know you want to know what's happened and build off either build that's off critical or, i think that's critical yeah, yeah and i yeah just doing the deed research on any piece mm -hmm. of property is just fascinating to me the history I mean, just to figure out how much of it was once cleared, right? There are data on that from the 1850s to the 1880s. If you really want to know, you can go find that. And in in Ancestry.com has the Census of Agriculture records. So, so you have to just trace your property back to then in the late 1800s, post-Civil War, right? That period there and, and uh, find the owner or owners and then uh, find them in the census. You can find out what they did for a living. Most of them were farmers and did other stuff. And then you can find their farm in the egg census and you'll see how many acres they had in it, crops, uh, woodlots, improved land, all kinds of interesting categories. So, and then there's also the 1940 photos. The, there was aerial photos taken pretty much everywhere in 1940. Now that's a long time ago. That's uh, 12 years before I was born. <laughs> so, um, and that is right when a lot of our current forest uh, originated, right? That stands that we're managing now on our lands, you know, may have been open land then. Wikipedia Woods uh, was about a third open then on those photo photos. And our other lands also had fields, right? Now they're all trees. So, so that dates those. Or if they were trees then, and you know that that probably was maybe always a woodlot, or at least has been a long time in forest. So... That sounds like an article to me. Yeah, I've it, maybe I'm looking for something to write about. Maybe that's what I'll do. As soon as yeah. we hang up here, I'll, I'll <laughs> spend the paper you you. fingers <laughs> to the keyboard. Yes, I know. So <laughs> no pressure. Let's see, Ron or Alan or David. 
you have something you like to ask me about 10 more minutes, a little less than 10 minutes. And who knows when we'll have Bob on again, so. Hey, Ron. Ron, here. Ron go right ahead. Bob, I love your YouTube videos. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, it, is there a textbook or a, a, a reference book or something that for a greenhorn like me that uh, you, you would recommend? Oh, you know, boy. There are some like introductory textbooks for woodlot owners that try to explain forestry, all of forestry, silviculture, management, measurements. Um, do I have one? I'm trying to think. There's two that come to mind. Um, uh, Tom McAvoy, I think he, he spells it T-H-O-M, Mac. E-V-O-Y. -E He's a retired now extension forester from Vermont. Um, I think he's written the most recent and more most accessible one of these for New Englanders. Okay, so Google that and whether it's still in print, I have no idea. I think Jess has a copy of it, but she's gone now. So I we can follow up on that. Um, there are other what else? You know, it's Molly Beatty wrote one a long time ago. Um, I'm, I was looking more for like a handbook on, you know, the spacing and how to do thinning and uh, oh, that much. That yeah. okay? You know, just the basics for a greenhorn that wants to go out in the woods and uh, improve his woodlot. Um, there are. Depends on, um, so I'm going to hold something up here. Um, there are these, you, I don't know if you can read that, it's backwards, I guess. Um, silvicultural Guide uh, to Northern Hardwoods. About a year ago, there's the, the White Pine Silvicultural Guide was just reissued for, uh, by a group of people in New Hampshire. I reviewed that, I think, Jen, didn't I, about a year ago in the Woodland, one of my articles. Yep. Um, those things exist for all forest types. Laura Kenefick, who's the scientist of the Forest Service, uh, and I and a few others are now, we're in the process of rewriting the spruce fir forest uh, silvicultural guide. Those are the, those are the handbooks that, for foresters. Some of them are, uh, the Northern Hardwood one and the Pine one probably are accessible to interested woodland owners if you're following. And you understand about spacing, you understand what basal area is. Uh, trees breaker, all of that, then that, th that's where you find the specifics, I think, and those silvicultural guides. So those, just type silvicultural guide for whatever. And uh, I don't think there's like one, you couldn't find a silvicultural guide for Maine. There isn't any such thing. So it, there tend to be for tree specific or forest type specific. Um, yeah, that, that's that's what I would suggest. I think McAvoy's book probably has some of those details. Being he, he was a Vermonter, probably talks about northern hardwood. I mean, yeah, any I think I'd have to look at it again to be sure. Yeah, and and I would you know being so shameless here, I do think our newsletters um, with Bob and Max McCormick's articles they've been writing for years on silviculture. Uh, you know, I bet we could compile that and make that a very useful um, set of resources, but certainly go back to our newsletters. Uh, we have an archive that goes back to 2007 on our website, on our members page. So I would, I mean, it's just, it's chock full. I mean, the amount of content Bob puts in his articles is amazing. So I, de I definitely recommend that. Yeah, but I can see what you want. I mean, I think some of it is just favoring good trees right well formed i think we all know what a good a, a crop tree is it's this i think the concept of crop tree silviculture is just a fundamental one for landowners because everybody can relate to that right they see trees the quantitative stuff about thinking about how okay how many trees do i need on an acre and what that's going to yield how much money's going to make is much more complicated but just favoring good crop trees is a is easy to do and easy to recognize, and the tools are easy to find and use. And um, 
you know, if you're cutting and this is where, okay, it's, if you just have nothing but sapling trees and you're cutting little trees to favor other little trees, that's all easy. But if you're trying, if you're trying to, Oh, we have big trees and they're maybe worth money. We don't want to just kill them, right. To favor something that's in the understory, then, then maybe we need to do a harvest, right. We can get paid to do our silviculture. So that, you know, it's hard to distill that sometimes these, because we have 20, 25 commercial species in May and they all have different products. You have to, th th this is what foresters go to school to learn in four years. I'm not trying to uh, prevent you from doing your own work. I think that's, I, I love landowners to do their own work and we all do that, right? Um, but, um, so I could write, you know, maybe I should uh, put in, put something together on just the basics of space, you know, the quantitative aspects or whatever, the numerical aspects of thinning. That's easy to do, and maybe with examples. What's what species, Ron? Do you have what? What? Are, what's give me an example of what your of the trees, the size of the trees, and the species you're you're dealing with? Uh, we had a harvest a couple of years ago, and okay. uh, and a selective harvest. I got a forester, um, okay, and um, uh, then last winter when we the there was a big windstorm up here and uh, yeah. a, a couple up. And so they left a bunch of beautiful trees for maybe, you know, 10 or 20 years from now. And uh, they are, uh, I must, I might've lost a hundred or I don't oh, know. Oh boy. Yeah. 100 or 200 tree, trees. Are those. So I got the forester back. He come, he came and he got the uh, contractor back and he salvaged. All yeah. at, least, at least got all those trees off the ground. Yeah. And way. So uh, we got that going. And so now, um, um, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, I'd like to replant some trees, you know, uh, yeah. I know red oak is a, a good one. I saw your yeah. video, how you went and got a couple of little uh, sapling oaks. You found them and replanted them. I saw that yeah. video. And, um, Especially and pine, that's easy to do with. Uh, why just digging wildlings if you have a source of two or three year old seedlings where they've come in along a road or something? Yeah, that's free free trees, really. What time of year you do that? Spring? You have to do that right in right in when the ground thaws. As soon as you can, the ground thaws in the spring. Like uh, the one that I put up this year, I think was the third week in April, where I went and dug white pine wildlings. From a from a side of an old skid trail where they they'd been they'd come in from the they started in 2018 from that 2017 seed crop so and you can just actually I dug them because I didn't want to damage the roots they were these were good sized three year old seedlings maybe a foot tall some of them I didn't um, smaller ones you can use, often just pull right Christmas tree growers have done that a lot for forever right with fir trees just pull them out of the forest floor now. Max would probably argue that you shouldn't be doing that. You should actually get genetically improved fir trees if you're going to be serious about growing Christmas trees. But, you know, uh, if you, you can also buy, and this is the time to do it. If you want to, if you're going to be doing planting, the only source really we have readily available uh, of local stock is New Hampshire, the state nursery in New Hampshire, which is near Concord. And they take orders and they often sell out of everything. Their orders need to be in, like you can start ordering the first of the year. So that's coming right up, right? Actually in forester's time. That's another thing, Jen, that probably on the winter calendar, if you're planting, you want to order your trees many months early, right? So, and then they'll, sh so you order them right in January. 40, uh, if you buy them in like oak or pine, common things to plant, you would get, if you buy hundreds of them, you're going to get paid like 40 cents a tree for them, 400, 1,000 seedlings. So that's not dirt cheap, but it's not a lot of money either. And you get, you can order 50 or hundred, which is a good way to get started. Um, get a good planting tool. We have this special planting shovel we use. It's what, $50 maybe for a good one. And then plant some trees, right? Protect them. The key with planting is not, you're not done when you're planted, right? You have to take care of them. You have to make sure they don't get overtopped by brush. Don't plant them in places where they're not going to be competitive or not get enough sun. Sounds like if you had, uh, this is really unfortunate. We had to do some salvage too. I mean, it was a bad winter for, for partial harvest for sure. And we ended up with some open land, more open. And that's what we were doing our oak planting this year. We planted 200 red oaks. And of course, if you're planting hardwoods, any hardwoods, 
um, almost anywhere because of the, the deer we harped about earlier, you know, you're going to probably have to protect them or the deer will eat them off. And that's, that becomes very expensive because you have to put them in these tubes, which you can also see on my YouTube channel. Well, we've hit the 10 o'clock mark. Um, Christine had sent a question. Um, I'm going to email that question to you, Bob, and you and she can chat unless you have a really quick answer to, is there any way to get- So ready to get rid of the weevil on young, like young trees, I guess she means mm -hmm. for those. Um, you can, yes, the answer, short answer is yes. If the weevil attacks the tr uh, these young trees and you can reach the dead terminal, then you go, and we do this too. This is a one-two punch. We do spraying, but then we also, it's not 100% effective. So you go back in early July, around the 4th of July, and you clip out, take your little hand clippers, clip out the dead leader that's now this so-called shepherd's crook, right? That's because it's dead and it's, dying off clip that out in that dead leader will be the pupae the pupil stage of the weevil the weevil are for about two weeks are in that dead shoot so you can nip them out and you go around all your woodlot and and just purge these out it's a sanitation kind of practice you take them back and you immediately put them in the fire pit and set them off burn them up <laughs> they this they just go up like nothing because it's pitchy dead pine shoots right these things just burn like nobody's business the, and then you also clip you can go to my youtube channel where i show this being done and you clip off all but one of the lateral branches so that that branch then the most dominant one takes over becomes the new leader those two steps can be done right away and that's only like within a few weeks after that shoot being killed by the weevil um that that may uh, over time reduce the population some, but it isn't nearly as effective as spraying, um, which you can you can get almost 100% control if your timing is good that way. And then the little bit of sanitation is follow, both follow up and this, to get the weevils and corrective. So it's all a good package. <clears throat> okay. Okay, that sounds like we, we got everything in. Um, I will... If there's more you want to ask Christine, please uh, feel free to be in touch with Bob and Sue. She knows how to get a hold of me. I'm happy yeah. to talk to her. So yeah, Eight okay. More at uh, main.edu. Right. Um, and again, I really appreciate everybody coming together back online. Uh, it's a nice resource and we're glad to have people together. Um, I really didn't do a good introduction of Maine Woodland Owners. Thank you for joining us. This is the Maine Woodland Owner uh, video programming series, and I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach. I'm also the editor of the newsletter. So this is a great way for me to get some ideas about what, what's on people's minds, what kinds of topics we want to include in our newsletter. So feel free to be in touch with me as well, Jen Hicks, Jen, J-E-N-N, -E -N, at mainwoodlandowners.org. Visit our website. Um, you'll see our events page. You'll see there are other video programs coming up. Uh, we have one for new woodland owners with Jeff Williams, one of our um, consulting forester board members. And we also have Harold Burnett uh, in early December talking about just forestry 101, what, what do you, you know, any questions mm -hmm. you might have about harvesting and uh, winter planning and forest management plans and all the technical aspects of managing your woods. So thanks again. I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, it's beautiful here in Maine. So um, I'm hoping that it continues this, this weekend and I hope everybody's well and we'll see you soon. Okay, Thank thanks for dialing in or calling in. Good, right. good to see y'all. Thanks, Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. All right, bye-bye.